been called the most outstanding military aircraft never flown. In many ways, the British Aircraft Corporation TSR-2 bomber was ahead of its time. Plans called for it to serve as a supersonic nuclear strike option capable of flying at an altitude of 200 feet to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. Test pilots claimed the TSR-2's flight characteristics were outstanding, and a Royal Air Force evaluation of the program suggested that there was no doubt that it could meet all of its mission goals. Yet after its first flight in 1964, the program was suddenly cancelled only a year later. Amid rumors of a conspiracy, all of the working prototypes were destroyed. General Operational Requirement 339 The USSR introduced surface-to-air missiles in the late 1950s, making many NATO high-altitude planes highly vulnerable. In 1959, the USSR used its S-75 Divina Sam to shoot down an aircraft for the first time, a Taiwanese English electric Canberra plane purchased from the United States. Operational requirement. Such a particular Soviet advancement presented an operational threat for which the UK stressed to respond to. In 1955, the Ministry of Supply began collaborating with English Electric to define the necessary parameters for the creation of a new aircraft that would replace the Canberra. Their studies yielded a list of requisites sent to several aircraft manufacturers in March 1957 under General Operational Requirement 339. The requirements were quite demanding and ambitious regarding the technology available back then. They wanted an all-weather, day and night, supersonic, long-range aircraft capable of flying at both low and high altitudes and of delivering nuclear or conventional bombs. Aside from asking for Mach 2 or higher, the British also wanted a plane capable of either short takeoff and landing or vertical takeoff and landing. However, the epoch's conventionalism considered air bases and runways to be the first things to go in upcoming wars. As a result, the requirements called for an aircraft that could take off and land on either rough fields or open areas. The deadline for submitting proposals in response to the insanely intense requirements was January 31, 1958. The 1957 Defense White Paper The first challenge along the aircraft's development was the release of the 1957 Defense White Paper by Defense Minister Duncan Sandys. In it, he claimed that ballistic missiles would be the primary weapon in future wars, pushing manned combat toward obsolescence. While these claims would be discredited by future combat, at the time these statements resonated among the public and political spheres. Ballistic missiles were attractive not only because they're unmanned, but because they can offer significant savings if compared with other technologies. The 1957 Defense White Paper sparked a debate that would continue for years, with Royal Air Force members passionately speaking and acting in favor of the project requested in GOR 339. Further Complications The very request for an aircraft was haunted by complications. In September 1957, only four months before the submission's deadline, the Ministry of Supply informed all the aviation companies that only multi-company proposals would be considered. This was a move by the government attempting to force mergers due to the large number of competing companies and the project's decreasing availability. Furthermore, there was infighting between the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force over the priority of their respective technologies. The Royal Navy was in the middle of NA-39, a project which would eventually yield the Blackburn Buccaneer, a low-altitude, overwater, subsonic attack plane. The competitiveness between the two branches of the British Army got so tense that the Royal Navy offered to match some of the GOR-339 requirements with their NE-39 project, but only if the Royal Air Force backed down from its own project. To worsen the situation, a highly influential former First Sea Lord and Chief of the Naval Staff, Lord Mountbatten, was a strong supporter of the Buccaneer and denouncer of the TSR-2 project. The Royal Air Force had to feign disinterest in the Royal Navy's plan to avoid compromising their own. The political situation became even more complicated when a proposal was accepted and a contract granted. The Conservative Party was in power at the time. In response to the agreement, the opposition, mainly the Labour Party, used the project as an anti-expenditures rhetorical point that often dragged the ambitious aircraft development through the mud. A new proposal. Although several proposals were submitted, the Air Ministry mostly considered the P-17A proposal by English Electric and Sort Brothers, as well as the Type 571 by the Vickers-Armstrong merger. The Vickers-Armstrong submission was considered more substantial and more impressive due to its detailed inclusion of avionics, support facilities, and decisive logistics considering the aircraft's design, though. 
yet the P-17A seems promising, albeit less so. In accordance with the political goal of consolidating aircraft companies, the contract would be granted to Bickers Armstrongs with English Electric as a subcontractor. The project was announced to the public under the name of Tactical Strike and Reconnaissance Mach 2, abbreviated as TSR-2. Works were authorized by Operational Requirement 343 on January 1, 1959. This new document established two new expectations for the aircraft. It should reach Mach 2 at altitude, and should be able to fly as low as 200 feet or less. The Combined Design In this electric suggested a delta wing design, which was preferable, while Vickers Armstrongs offered a better fuselage design. The plan turned into a coordinated Frankenstein-like project, being the front half built by Vickers Armstrong and the rear built by English Electric. Under significant pressure, the companies merged, adding Bristol Aeroplane Company and Hunting Aircraft to the merger. Consequently, the 1960 contract fell to this new consortium, the British Aircraft Corporation. The plane was designed to use two Bristol Siddeley Olympus reheated turbojets. The drawn plans projected a sustained speed of Mach 2.05, at between 37,000 feet and 51,000 feet. The aircraft had some intensely sophisticated cutting-edge avionics, which contributed to its high cost. Some of its features, such as the forward-looking and side-looking radars for navigational fixing, would only become part of aviation several years later. The autopilot system was thought to be one of the most, if not the most advanced of its kind, enabling long-distance sorties thanks to the workload reduction for the pilot and crew. No prototypes were made for the project, however. The first development batch of nine airframes served as a line of prototypes in everything but name. The decision to avoid work on prototypes had a negative effect over progress due to stringent production standards. Four years after the project had begun, the first airframes, prototypes in all actuality, were ready, but featuring partial emissions and differing from the intended future production model. Tactical Nukes at the beginning of the TSR-2 project development, the British had sought for the plane to carry their existing tactical nuclear bomb, Red Beard. They believed the aircraft would carry out attacks on NATO targets assigned to the Royal Air Force, and wanted to be prepared regardless of weather, distance, or daylight. It was established that Red Beard could not be carried externally while at supersonic speed, leading to Operational Requirement 1177, calling for a new tactical nuke. The requirement had to be further modified in July of 1962, when a ministerial ruling determined that all tactical nukes must have a maximum yield of 10 kilotons. The Royal Air Force wanted a small tactical nuke that could be adapted to increase the yield if the norm was ever lifted. It was then decided that the TSR-2 needed to carry four WE-177A bombs, two in the fuselage and two under the wings. The bomb bay had to be adapted for the smaller WE-177A now that it wouldn't carry red beard bombs. Testing. Testing for the expensive and innovative TSR-2 was rocky at best. In February 1964, an engine exploded during a test bed run. The experts could not figure out why. Soon after, the first airframe was disassembled at the test center. This resulted in a logistical issue that postponed testing for a three-month period. That summer, pre-flight tests began slowly due to problems with the engines and the landing gear. Another engine blew up while tested. It was discovered that the issue was rooted in the low-pressure turbine shaft malfunctioning. However, the problem was never fully resolved, and even under such conditions, the government insisted on launching the first full test flight before the 1964 election, but the Labour Party was expected to rise to power afterward. Celebrated test pilot Roland Beaumont was called on board to conduct this flight, knowing that the engines could explode. He would later state that, quote, the first flight was more a political gesture than a logical stage in a professionally conducted technical program. The flight took place at the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment in Wiltshire on September 27, 1964. The flight was successful, but the landing gear did not retract after takeoff. That same problem persisted until the 10th test. The 14th test saw the first supersonic flight, and the aircraft reached Mach 1. By the end of the program, 24 test flights had taken place. All of these used the rudimentary and incomplete versions of the aircraft, which several test pilots repeatedly claimed were outstanding. Still, major electronic components were missing, and the aircraft was not reaching the required goals set out by OR-343. 
In an attempt to save costs and continue with the project, the requirements were reduced to reach a combat radius of 650 nautical miles, a maximum speed of Mach 1.75, and a takeoff run-up of 3,000 feet instead of 1,800. A Cancellation Conspiracy The U.S. began developing the F-111 Aardvark as a competing strategic nuclear bomber in the early 1960s. According to some British engineers, the TSR-2 could have been considered superior to the F-111 in many ways. In fact, it's been suggested that at least on paper, the TSR-2 was years ahead of anything the U.S. was developing. So why then did the British resolve to consider the American swing wing as an alternative to the TSR-2? When this possibility came out to public light, British Aircraft Corporation employees held a strike. In response, the recently elected Labour government denied that the American plane was under consideration. At least publicly, the decision to eventually cancel the TSR-2 was made on April 1, 1965, due to projected cost overruns. Despite the earlier denials, the Labour government decided to explore the possibility of purchasing F-111s instead. The completed parts of the TSR-2 were scrapped within six months, following the project's cancellation. Behind the scenes, it's been rumored that the U.S. forced the British to abandon the program. However, beyond cost, labor politics likely played a more critical role in ending the TSR-2. Only two out of the nine completed airframes survived, one at the Royal Air Force Museum in Cosford, and a nearly complete one at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford. The cancellation of the TSR-2 was one of many signs the United Kingdom's imperial decline would affect every aspect of British governance. Defense priorities and budgets were deeply cut by the pullback of British power. Additionally, the UK could no longer foot the bill for a technologically advanced military with the global reach of its past. Despite its superior flight performance, the TSR-2, if you ignore the politics, may have simply been a victim of doing one thing too well and was too specialized for the mission profiles of the future. The TSR-2 may have been the best potential aircraft to deliver a tactical nuclear strike, but it became increasingly difficult to imagine a scenario in which Britain would pull the nuclear trigger. After cancelling the TSR-2, Britain backpedaled on plans to buy the US F-111 after the price rose beyond what the TSR-2 would have cost. The UK did not require an aircraft that could fulfill the TSR-2 requirements, but the addition of more mission flexibility until 1980 when it developed the Panavia Tornado in collaboration with Italy and Germany.